So far, we've only seen molecules with neutral atoms that don't bear any charge, but that's obviously not always going to be the case. So in this video, we'll talk precisely about that – formal charges in organic molecules. So the easiest way to approach the formal charges is through bonding patterns. We know how the bonding pattern looks for uh, neutral core elements. So for instance, in the case of the carbon, we are going to have carbon with four bonds. In the case of nitrogen, we are going to have nitrogen with three bonds and an electron pair. Something like an oxygen will have two bonds and two electron pairs, while halogens will have one bond and three electron pairs, and also let's throw hydrogen here as well for good measure, so hydrogens only have one bond. Well, that is where our charge, I'm going to put charge here, is zero. Now, in the case where the element has a negative charge, then we're going to make one of those bonds into an electron pair. So if my charge is negative one, then on carbon, we're going to have one of the bonds becoming an electron pair. In the case of nitrogen, we're now going to see two bonds and two electron pairs like that. In the case of oxygen, we'll have one bond, three electron pairs, then, for halogens, we're going to have a freestanding halogen with four electron pairs and no bonds, and same thing we're going to have for the hydrogen, where now it is a hydride anion. Notice, the negatively charged halide and hydride anion, they do not have any bonds, so they can only exist as free-floating ions when they're negatively charged. Now, when it comes to the positively charged species, that's where things get a little bit more interesting. In the case of carbon, I'm going to still have three bonds and I'm going to have an empty orbital. I will show this empty orbital here as a little box. For nitrogen, however, we are now going to see typically four bonds. For oxygen, we're going to have three bonds and an electron pair. Halides, when they're positively charged, going to have two bonds and have two electron pairs like this. And finally, the hydrogen, again, has no bonds and going to be our proton. Important thing to keep in mind here, or should I say two important things here. Heteroatoms should always have a full octet. So all the heteroatoms that we have over here, nitrogen, oxygen, and halogens, all of these guys have the full octet. While it is theoretically possible to have heteroatoms with an open shell, aka only have six electrons around them, they are too unstable for the realm of organic molecules and we won't normally see those. On top of that, proton, as I've already mentioned, has no bonds either when it is positively charged or when it is a hydride ion, then it's not going to have any bonds as well. The only species here that is quote-unquote allowed to have an incomplete octet is going to be a carbon with a positive charge. We're going to call those species carbocations. And just because those species do exist doesn't mean that they're necessarily stable. Carbocations are quite unstable, and it's probably one of the most unstable species that we are normally going to encounter uh, within the scope of organic chemistry. However, the carbocations, carbons with only six electrons around them and an empty orbital, is something that we are going to encounter, while that is going to be essentially not an existing species in the case of the heteroatoms. For heteroatoms like nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, etc., they will always have a full octet within the scope of our course. So here is something very important I want to point out. While hydrogens and electron pairs can be implicit, especially when we are drawing bond line structures, charges are never implicit. The only time when the charge is not going to be shown is when, well, we are asking you to find that charge. Other than that, we are always going to show the charge. Losing charges is a very common mistake I see a lot of students make. So always make sure you're checking your charges each time you draw a structure. So how do we calculate the charge if an atom doesn't have a charge, or maybe we're unsure about the charge, or a charge is just not given and we need to find one? Well, there are two ways. There is an official way, which is going to say that our charge equals the number of valence electrons minus one half of 
bonding electrons and minus non-bonding electrons like that. Well, it's a little bit mouthful. There is a quick way that I like a little bit more than charge equals valence electrons minus lines minus dots. This way it's a little bit easier to remember what's going on here. So to look at my couple of examples that I have here. In the first example, I have a carbon atom over here. The valence electrons for the carbon atom are going to be four. If we look at the periodic table, the carbon atom is sitting in the fourth group of the periodic table, fourth column, so it's going to have four valence electrons. Then we have three lines attached to it, so three bonds, and we have zero uh, electrons on it, so my charge this way is going to be plus one. So I will show that carbon has a charge of plus one. Now boron. Boron is located in the third group of the periodic table, so I'm going to have three valence electrons minus four bonds around it, minus zero electrons sitting on it, so that's going to give me a charge of negative one, and I'm going to show it here as such. Then I have an oxygen atom. I'm going to highlight that oxygen as well, like this, and in this case, uh, for my oxygen, I have six valence electrons, because oxygen is located in the sixth group in the periodic table, minus one bond that is uh, attaching our oxygen to carbon, minus six dots that I have around oxygen, so that overall gives me a charge of negative one. And finally, for my last molecule over here, actually, let's look at all of the core atoms and see what type of a charge we're going to have around them. So carbon over here, I'm even going to color code it. So for the carbon, I have four valence electrons minus four lines connecting it to other atoms minus zero dots around that that gives me the overall charge zero. I don't have to show the uh, charge of zero on carbon, but I'm going to show it for the completeness in this particular case. Then I have my nitrogen atom in the middle. Well, for that one, what I have is valence electrons for the nitrogen going to be five minus four lines minus zero dots, giving me a charge of plus one. So I'm going to indicate plus on the nitrogen like that. And finally, I also have nitrogen on the right side over here. I'm going to highlight that one as well. And for that atom, I'm going to draw it down there. I have, again, five valence electrons minus two lines connecting it to the other uh, nitrogen and minus four dots. In this case, I'm going to have a charge of negative one, so I'm going to show it like that. See how I write my charges? I like to circle my charges. That is uh, absolutely not necessary, but that is one of those kind of quirky little habits that a lot of chemists have, so your instructor is most likely going to be circling their charges as well, and you're going to have uh, many textbooks circling charges too. As I said, that's not necessary, but that's kind of a traditional way we show our charges, just so you don't forget about its existence, or it's it's sort of like popping up and uh, making it a little bit more visually explicit that a certain atom has a charge. Probably the trickiest part is dealing with formal charges on bond line structures. Here I have a couple of examples, and in this case, for my top molecule, I have a formal charge over here on this carbon atom. So, in order to figure out what exactly is going on there, I'm going to go back to my bonding patterns and I will remember that a positively charged carbon has three bonds and it has an empty orbital, which I will show as a little box over here. So, if I'm looking at my atom that I have highlighted here in this uh, system, I have a carbon connected to a CH3 group on the left, connected to a carbon on the right, then I have a double bond, carbon, nitrogen, and two more carbons like that. Adding all the necessary hydrogens to the rest of my molecule gives me three hydrogens on the right, three hydrogens on the bottom, electron pair on the nitrogen while I am at it, one hydrogen here, one hydrogen here. Now, my carbon in question, I will highlight that as well, so it's very clear which one we are talking about. So this carbon has two bonds right now. If it has a positive charge, it means that it needs to have one more bond 
and a positive charge. And since that bond is coming from uh, our uh, bond line structure, is something that we did not have there to begin with, that bond like that must be a hydrogen, which means that a positively charged carbon in this particular case has two bonds to carbons, has one bond to a hydrogen, and has a positive charge that represents an empty orbital on that carbon. Remember that carbon will always have four things attached to it. Those four things can be either four bonds, four lines in general, or they can be three lines and a plus charge, or it can be three lines and an electron pair, which is going to give us a negative charge. So using this principle for my next molecule, I have a carbon with a charge over here. I will highlight it in pink. So for that carbon, it means that I have one connection to a CO, one connection to another carbon on the bottom, and I will quickly redraw the rest of my molecule like that. So my carbon with a negative charge needs to have an electron pair and there will be one more implicit hydrogen on it sitting like that and I will add CH2 on the bottom like this to complete my molecule. So in this case my pink carbon has three bonds, two of those two nearby carbons, one bond to the uh, implicit hydrogen and it has an electron pair which is going to give us a negative charge. So that's how you deal with the formal charges in organic chemistry. And before we wrap up uh, for today, there is one more thing I want to point out. Inorganic molecules, while technically possible, having a charge of a greater than plus one or minus one value is very rare. So if you've calculated your charge on your atom and you've got something like plus three or negative four or something like that, double check what you are doing there. Organic molecules with large charges on atoms are incredibly unstable. It doesn't really mean that you cannot have a molecule with multiple charges. That's a completely different story. That is quite possible and you are going to see molecules with multiple charges. But molecules with a single large charge, like plus two, plus three, etc., on a single atom, it's on the other hand is just basically an oddity. Well, as with anything in organic chemistry, practice makes it perfect. So go ahead and check the links in the description below or go to organicchemistrytutor.com to get more practice questions and uh, see how you do. Also, don't forget to leave your questions and comments below, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so, so you don't miss any future updates, and hit the like button if you found this video helpful or hit dislike if you didn't. And I will see you in the next video. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon.